Um, bow your heads with me. Grab your Bibles. Um, I'm going to invite you to keep your Bibles open. I want to read some scriptures that we're going to be sharing with you this morning. I'm excited about what God has in store for us, but we just want God to just move and have his way this morning. So bow your heads, let's pray, and then we're going to go into the Word this morning. Father, you're awesome. Your name is beautiful, God. You're an awesome God. You are the living Word. I just thank you for the worship experience this morning, God. Just beautiful and an opportunity just to worship you and serve you and celebrate you for who you are. So as we stand to deliver your word, and we've been in the series, Meet Me at the Cross, Holy Spirit, I empty myself, and I invite you to take up residence in the throne of my life, God. Speak through me, as I say every Sunday. Felix has nothing to say unless you speak, Holy Spirit. So God, this morning I'm praying for preaching power. I am praying that you would pull out of me that which have been deposited, that people will see you and recognize who you are and what you have been doing in our midst. So God, we love you. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for what you're doing. So God, let me rest in you this morning, God. Let me rest in you as we celebrate your holy name and we give you praise and bless you for you. So God, move and have your way in our midst. In your name we pray and thank you. Amen and amen. Hey, listen, wherever you find yourself, I want you to turn to your neighbor or to the person next to you and just say, Hey, neighbor, I want to invite you to meet me at the cross. Yeah, amen. Tell the other neighbor. Say, other neighbor, wherever you find yourself. So I want to invite you to meet me at the cross. Amen. Today we are um, in the third part of, I'm going to call the five-part series where we've been talking about Meet Me at the Cross. The first part where we spoke, we spoke extensively about the need for the cross. And what we saw, we've been, we had this cross on the platform for a specific reason, um, because we realized that where it says, by one man or woman, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all of us, because we all have sinned. Come on, are you hearing me this morning? I myself find myself a sinner in needs of God's grace, and I think every person under the sound of my voice can raise their hand and say the same thing. We are all sinners in need for God's grace. So we saw that, that the cross came about because of the sin of the world. The second thing that we saw the following week was what we referred to as the journey to the cross, meaning that not only did, did, did God send or position the cross as a recompense for sin, that it took a unique individual, a unique path to get from sin all the way through salvation. So we studied extensively last week the, light, the life of the Israelites and how it was that God chose them. And then what we saw specifically was in, in the book of Genesis um, where Adam and Eve sinned, God provided a way. He provided a method to get all the way to the cross and that how he chose Abraham and he chose Abraham's lineage and Abraham's descendants and Abraham's seed to get us all the way to the New Testament to the birth of Christ our Lord and Savior. So today, I want to spend a few moments to talk about the third thing, which is going to be the Christ of the cross. Now, just repeat that word. Just say, we're going to look this morning. Come on, say, we're going to look at the Christ of the cross. Now, that's important because I want to spend a moment there just to kind of talk through that because the Christ of the cross plays a critical role for us to understand forgiveness Next week, we're going to look at the fact that he died, and then on Easter Sunday, we're going to look at the empty cross, and I'm kind of excited about that. I can't wait to get to that. But today, we're going to talk about the Christ of the cross, and we're going to look at that. Now, let me begin with an interesting word and an interesting statement I want you to process with me. And the statement kind of goes like this. Atoning for or paying for the price of sin requires a special sacrifice. I'm going to say it again. If we're going to atone for sin or if we're going to pay for the price of sin, any old sacrifice won't do. It requires a special sacrifice. So I want that word atone to resonate with you and to get in your spirit and to get into your heart and to get in your souls this morning because we're going to spend some time talking about that. 
And in case you don't know what atone means, atonement then is the process by which two individuals, maybe a strain, maybe they've been separated, maybe they've fallen apart, where atonement is the process by which these two parties are brought back together again, and then they can enter into a relationship once again. You will remember this from last week. When Adam and Eve sin, here's what we saw in Genesis 3 and 21. The Scripture says that God took skin and he made garments, and he covered them, right? So here's what that means. Here's what that means. When Adam and Eve sinned and they partook of the forbidden fruit, a chasm was established between them and God. And here's the important thing of what we shared last week. God took the initiative, here's the word, to atone for the sin or to bring them back into a relationship again. And how did God do that? He did that by killing an animal and taking the skin, and I love this phrase, and he covered them, right? Now, now, listen, y'all, isn't it good news to know that God will cover you? Yes. Oh, come on, I need some more amens than that. I know, I know, I know it ain't that many of us in here, but it's good to know. I think there's a lesson there where as humans, we need to learn how to cover each other, not talk about each other. Oh, come on, say amen. We got to learn how to do that, right? Isn't it good to know that God covers us? And so what's being nuanced in, in chapter 3, verse 21 of the book of Genesis when it says he took the skin and he covered them, what that was, it was a foreshadow into God's atonement process where God permanently is going to cover you and God has this process and he has this mechanism and he has this way of covering us when we blow it. So what we saw scripturally in Genesis chapter 3 and 15 was sort of a foreshadow where God said, if you would look at 3 and 15, where he said after man and woman sin, he said to the serpent, here's what he said, um, the, the seed of the woman will bruise your head, but you will, um, uh, what's this, crush his head, but you will bruise his heel. Let me get that right. And what that was, that was a foreshadow into some time down the way, if I may use that term, God was going to send a savior. He was going to send, let me just go here. We talked about this last week, his son. He was going to send someone into the world to atone for our sin or to bring us back into right relationship with God. So that promise was made, even if you were to look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, he started to make the promise there. And here's what I want you to see that we did last week that we're going to pick up today. The entirety of the Old Testament was really the story about the path for the seed of the woman. I want you to get that. We know them as the children of Israel. We know them as the nation of Israel. But that was a people group. It was a group of individuals through which the, the Christ child was going to enter into the earth realm. But here's where I want to go this morning. While we were waiting for the Christ child to be born, God in his grace had provided a mechanism, a method, or a process such that in the Old Testament, when a person sin, you don't have to die in your sin. He provided a mechanism and he provided a way. He provided a, a sacrificial system such that if one would sin, there was a way for their sin to be atoned for or there was a way for their sin to be covered. My goodness, I like that word. Come on, say amen. There was a way for that to happen. And, 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 that, and, and, and here's what it says. While we were waiting for the seed of the woman to be manifested in its fullest sense in the New Testament, our Old Testament saints weren't left alone. God provided a way to cover them. He provided a way, a method and a methodology for them to be taken care of. So here's what you need to know. That Hebrew word atone, Whenever that word is used in the Old Testament, it conveys or conveys the idea of covering or to hide or to put someone under and not charge them for the sin they had committed. 
My goodness, that's good news. I got to say it again. I got to say it again. So the Old Testament, while, while we were waiting for this seed to be manifested in the New Testament, the Old Testament in its entirety, God had put a method and a process and a, a, a sacrificial system in place such that if you were an Old Testament a saint or a person that was in relationship with God and you sin, there was a method for you to be covered, listen to me, so you didn't have to die in your sin. Now, come on, y'all, isn't that good news? We haven't even gotten to the New Testament yet, but, but that's good news. You kind of get where I'm going. So here's what that looks like. If you were to go with me, and don't go here. We're gonna, we have a lot of scriptures we're going to read. In the book of Leviticus, specifically verse 4 of the book of Leviticus, let me tell you about what that looked like. It was a, a sacrificial system that God put in place, and the sacrificial system worked similar to this. If a person sinned, something had to die and their blood had to cover your sin. So the process of atonement in the Old Testament in Leviticus chapter 4, it looks something similar to this. If it was the priest by chance or the leader or an elder of the congregation who sinned, a bull needed to be offered as a sacrifice. The bull would be killed um, if for, for the sins of, of the, the priest and the blood would be sprinkled all over the altar and then the fat from that bull would then be burnt on the offer on the altar symbolizing symbolizing the truth that something is covering the sin of the individual who sinned right now if you were to move forward to what they would call the day of atonement the day of atonement was pretty special it was pretty symbolic five animals, and it was a very ceremonial process that was involved in that. There was a bull, there were two goats, and then there were two rams. It was five animals total that was involved. Here's what the bull would symbolize, is that if the priest or the leader sinned, they would kill the bull, and they would go through the same process that I just mentioned. Here's where the two um, goats came into play. They would kill the first goat, and then they would sprinkle the blood of the goat of the altar, and they would purify the temple, and they would purify the altar, and they would make all that right. And then the people, secondly, would confess all their sins, and they would place the sins of the people symbolically on the second goat, and then they would take that goat and place it in the wilderness, and release it, and that goat would run away, symbolize, meaning the scapegoat, which would symbolize that your sins were being forgiven and it was taken away from you, never to be remembered no more. Now, here's the other two animals, right? Anybody ever sinned and you know God forgave you, but you're still struggling with the guilt of the sin? Come on, am I just talking to me? Come on, y'all, and you walk around with the guilt of that thing? The other two animals serve the purpose that they then, you would place your guilt on the other two animals, and then those animals would be killed, symbolizing the guilt of your sin being taken away. So the Old Testament, it had, it had a very ritualistic process that one had to go through for the forgiveness of the sin. This process was so extensive that even if you didn't have a farm and even if you didn't have money, it, it covered the rich as well as the poor. It was comprehensive that the poor could bring birds. You can find whatever you, you, you could bring to the altar, but the point was there was a method and a mechanism for taking care of your sin in the Old Testament. And lock into this, that all happened while we waited for the seed of the woman that God promised in Genesis to come, right? So now the Old Testament is done with. We are in the New Testament. Come on, say amen for the New Testament. And there's a whole switch now. There's a switch that takes place in the New Testament where the sacrificial system still exists, but the sacrificial system of the New Testament looks completely different than it did in the Old Testament, right? Because when we get to the New Testament, here's what we find out. The seed of the woman has finally entered the earth in the form of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Come on, y'all, that's good news. And, and, and he died and he paid the price for our sin. So here's what that means. I don't have to kill Betsy no more. 
I don't have to find a bull and allow that bull to die in my place. We're going to look at some scripture. What, 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 what God did is he sent his son and his son, the seed of the woman, here's what we said last week, who came through the lineage of Abraham, who came through Isaac, Jacob, and all of them was born in a stable and was placed in that manger, that Christ took care of my sin and your sin permanently by dying on the cross. That, that's the good news, by dying on the cross. So when I say, meet me at the cross, I want us to go to the cross for a while to find out who that Christ really is. Because my problem with believers today is, is, is because we don't really what understood or understand what happened on the cross, I am concerned that we minimize the importance of the sacrifice. We minimize the importance of what God did on that cross of Calvary. We minimize the importance of who died in our place. Let, let me go here, let me go here. In, in the Old Testament, if I had to give up an unblemished lamb, and that's the principle of the Old Testament, is that this sacrifice could not have any marks on it. The sacrifice could not be bruised. The sacrifice could not be worse. It had to be the best of the best. It had to be an unblemished bull or an unblemished goat or an unblemished ram or an unblemished lamb. It had to be a perfect sacrifice. So here's what that looks like. In the Old Testament, you had sense enough to know that for your sins to be forgiven, it had to cost you something. The problem with me and the problem with you in the New Testament is forgiveness doesn't cost us nothing. Ah, and because it doesn't cost us like it costs in the Old Testament, we minimize the sacrifice and we do not understand the gravity and the extent of what God did for us in dying on the cross. So what I want to do today, just for the next few minutes, I want you to see today who the Christ that died on that cross really is. Come on, I want you to see that this morning. I, I, want, you, I want you to see um, who he really is so that we can understand what's really happening on that cross. So I want you to grab your Bibles and go with me, first of all, to the book of Hebrews chapter 9. I'm going to read a few scriptures. Hebrews chapter 9. And jump down to verse 13. I want to read Hebrews 9 and 13. And I want you to see what that scripture is saying. Then we're going to walk through this. Not going to be before you too long this morning because I want you to hear what God is saying and say the importance of what happened on that cross. When you look at Hebrews chapter 9, verse 13, here is what it does. It refers back to the Old Testament. Notice what it says. If the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer, I'm in the ESV, sanctify for the purifying of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscious, I like that word, conscious from dead works to serve a living God. Okay, let, let, let me, because that might have went over your head a little bit. Here's what Hebrews is saying. When I look at the Old Testament, if the blood of a goat and the blood of a, a bull and sprinkling the blood on the altar and putting the ashes over me as a sinner, it says, if that back then could purify me or forgive me or cleanse me from the sin that I committed, here's what it says, how much more cleaning will I receive if it is the blood of Christ through, what is this way? It says, through the, the, the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God. And I like this, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Here's what happened. In the Old Testament, here's what Hebrews is saying. I would sin, I would take a bull, depending on my position in the church, or a ram, and I would bring that to the church. And the priest would take that thing, he would kill it, 
and he would sprinkle the blood on me and he would take the ashes and put it over me and he would put the meat all over the altar, right? And then I would say, cleanse um, for what an animal did. I'm going to say it again. Cleanse for what an animal did. This is important. Cleanse for what an animal did. And here's what Hebrews is saying. If an animal could make you feel cleansed, imagine what the blood of Jesus Christ. Y'all not hearing me. Y'all not hearing me. I'm going to say it again. I'm saying it. If an animal could make you feel as if your sins has been forgiven in the Old Testament, how much more do you think the blood of Christ can do, lock into this, for your conscience. Now that's important because here's what I said happened in Leviticus, is that the animal cleansed your sin, but you still had the guilt, and you placed the guilt of your sin on this ram or the other animal. Now, what I like about what happened on Calvary, there is not an animal for sin, and an animal for guilt, and an animal for conscience. It is one, so I wish I had somebody in here. How much more forgiveness? That's Hebrews. And he's just setting the tone. The problem, the problem with me and the problem with you is we really don't know who the Christ of the cross is. And sometimes we confuse our theology and we equate him to be equivalent. Oh, he just took the place of an animal. <laughs> I don't make that mistake. That's what Hebrew says. If an animal could do that, and, and here's the thing about the animal. Let me give this to three. The animal could forgive you, cause you to feel forgiven, but it couldn't get you into heaven. I wish I had somebody. Y'all just a little too quiet for me. Forgiveness plus heaven. Forgiveness, no heaven. Forgiveness plus heaven. I wish I had somebody in here. Forgiveness, no eternal life. Forgiveness plus, are you with me? Eternal life. Come on, come on, come on. Forgiveness, but you might still feel guilty. Come on. Forgiveness, but you might still feel the burden. Forgiveness, but your conscience still plays games with you. Forgiveness and a renewed mind. Forgiveness and a cleansed heart, forgiveness, and a fresh start. How much more, he's saying, impact does that have? The problem is we don't know who's on the cross. That's the problem, right? And we think it's just a sin substitute. Let me quote this. Y'all all know this. Pastor Katani mentioned it. John 3.16. For God so loved the world. Come on, y'all know it. That he gave his what? Y'all know it. That whosoever believeth in him should not what? But have what? Here's my theology in interpreting that passage. When I look at here, I see the Son of God, and I'm cool with that. But what God is really saying in John 3.16, when you look at that, don't just see the Son of God, see God himself. Oh, that changes things. Right? That if your doctrine of the Trinity is right, the Son is the Father in bodily form. This is going to mess you up. And this is the depth of what I want to communicate to you this morning. The Christ of the cross is the God of the cross because the God that I serve, you're going to see this in a little while, turned himself into his Son and he came and placed himself on the cross. So let me go ahead, let me go ahead, let me go ahead. If an animal could forgive me, how much more can God himself? How much more? You see the importance of him covering me? Let me go here. What I'm trying to communicate is in the New Old Testament, when Adam and Eve sinned, God killed an animal and he made clothes and covered them. In the New Testament, when I sin, God killed himself. <laughs> to cover.
cover me. Come on, y'all. I'm talking about a covering that you've got to lock into. I'm talking about a covering that nobody else could do. Why? Because it was God himself. I wish I had somebody in here. In the form of his son. People, if that doesn't cause you to worship, if that doesn't cause you to change everything about yourself, my entire week was spent in repentance because I'm saying, God, you didn't send an animal. You didn't send a representative. You, did, you, you came yourself. How dare me? To continue to live in sin. How dare me to continue to mess up? How dare me? When you did it, I wish I had a praying church this morning. When you did it yourself. Let me show you this in scriptures. Y'all go, go to Philippians. Go to Philippians. Philippians chapter 2. I'm almost there. Philippians chapter 2. Look at this. Look at this. This is good stuff. Philippians chapter 2, let me read this. I'm getting excited. Look at verse 5, two verses. Say amen if you're there. He says, have this mind, the ESV, let this mind be in you, which was also yours in Christ Jesus. Let me preach this from the cross. It says here, let this mind be in you, verse 5, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Listen to this, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God as a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant and being born in the likeness of men, it says this, and being found in a human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death even death on a what? Cross. Let me read it one more time. Let me read it. I'm going to explain it. Have this mind in you, among yourself, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form, come on, say form, of God, did not count equality with God as a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant and being born in the likeness of men, and being found in the form of a human, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Let, let me help you exegetically with that. Here's what the text say. Our attitude should be like this, like the person who was on the cross. Assume for a moment this is heaven, and God lives in heaven. He said he had the form of God, the Greek word used is the Greek word morphe. And what that word means, it's the very essence of who the thing is, right? So here's what it's saying. The person on the cross had the morphe of God. Here's what it means. The person on the cross had everything, every essence, every molecule, if I can say such a thing, every all the DNA of who God is himself. So in other words, it starts by saying, the person on the cross was God. Yeah. Yeah. Then it also says he had the form of God, but he also had the form of a human. So here's what happened. God realized that if I'm going to die, I can't die as God. So for me, for my blood to be shed, because God don't have blood, I'm going to take on the form of a man. So he took on all the DNA characteristics of a man while remaining God the whole time, Lord Jesus. And so we don't get confused. Inside it was man. Inside it was God. Here's schema, the third word form. Outside it looked like you and it looked like me. And the reason he did that was so the God-man, his blood can be sprinkled on the altar, and his ashes can cover the sins that you and I committed. Come on, I want you all to see this. The Christ on the cross was 100% God. The Christ on the cross was 100% man, 
And the Christ on the cross had no need to compete because the only way my sin could be forgiven was not that an animal needed to die. God had to do it himself. Let, let, let me give you one more passage, then we're going to wrap this thing up. Go with me to Colossians. Go to Colossians. This is the last one. Go to Colossians. Colossians chapter 5. This is a good one. Let, let me show you this. Colossians chapter 5. It's describing now. It's describing who the Christ of the cross is. And notice what it's saying. Colossians chapter 1, let me read. Jump down to verse 13. It's describing Jesus. Here's what it says. He, being Christ, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Verse 16, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authority, all things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things are held together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning. He is the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. Verse 19, for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, don't miss that, through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth, in heaven, or in heaven, watch this, making peace by the blood of his cross. Preacher, why are you saying this? You'll remember with me, in the Old Testament, the sacrifice had to be perfect. You'll remember with me, in the Old Testament, the sacrifice had to be unblemished. Come on. You'll remember with me, in the Old Testament, the sacrifice could not have a mark or a defect or deficiency on it. And here's why God had to come himself. Because when God searched all of his creation, he could not find a perfect person to come and die in our place. Matter of fact, if he had his way, he would have sent Adam, but Adam disqualified himself when he sinned in the garden. Come on, y'all know this. He, he could have sent Abraham, but Abraham disqualified himself when he lied about Sarah, his wife. He could have sent Noah, but Noah disqualified himself when he was drunk after the flood. I wish I had somebody in here. He could have sent Samson, but Samson disqualified himself by messing with the Philistines. He could have sent David, but David... David disqualified himself by messing with Bathsheba. He could have sent Felix, but Felix disqualified himself by sinning in the world. He could have sent you, but you disqualified yourself. He couldn't find a perfect being. So God himself, you've heard this, clothed himself in earthly garments. And he came as God in the form of Christ and died on that cross. So you and I can have access to him. Here's the Christ of the cross. God incarnated or God made into flesh to die for me and to die for you. Here's what I heard Pastor Gatani say to one of the baptismal candidates. She said, do you believe that Christ died for your sins? Do you believe that Christ has forgiven you for your sins, for sins you've committed now for sins you've committed then, and for sins you're committed in the future. Here's what that young lady says. She says, I do. Here's the good news. All of our sins, past, present, and future, has been forgiven. Here's what that means. When I sin tomorrow, I don't have to go get a bull. I just got to look to the cross. I wish I had somebody. JB, I wish I had somebody in here. If I sin now, I don't have to go get a bull. All I got to do is look to the cross. I wish I had somebody in here. If I sin 10 years from now, well, let me go here. When your great, 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 great grandchildren sin, if they tarry that long, they don't have to bring nothing to the altar. All they've got to do is look to the cross. I've been saying this every week, and I'm going to say it again. We must be taught how to look up to the hills for where does our help come from? Our help comes from the Lord, the maker and the heaven of the earth. The Christ of the cross is the God of heaven 
who incarnated himself into flesh so that you and I can have a right to the tree of life, so that you and I can have access to him. As we pray this morning, I'm going to say, if you have not said yes to the Lord, as the worship team makes their way to the platform, I want to give you a chance to say yes to God. I want to give you a chance to surrender to God. I want to give you a chance to say, Lord, thanks for who you are and what you've done. I'm going to meet you at the cross. I'm going to meet you at the cross for what you did. So wherever you find yourself, be it in Africa, be it in the United States, be it in whatever country or continent or state you may be in right now, we serve a God who came in the form of flesh to eliminate the sacrificial system of the Old Testament that all we've got to do is look to him and live. Salvation is real simple. Jesus paid it all. All to him we owe. Sin is left to stain, but his blood, we're going to see that next week, the death on the cross, his blood, his blood, his blood has washed it as white as snow. All you've got to do is say, Lord Jesus, forgive me. Come into my heart and save me. And he does just that. Salvation is that simple. So bow your heads with me and let's pray this morning as the worship team ministers softly that God would just move and have his way. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for what you're doing. I thank you for who you are. And as your word has gone forth this morning, I thank you for the Christ of the cross because it's been revealed to me that that's you. You incarnated yourself in the flesh and came in the form of your son to die in my place. I thank you for that. It didn't cost me nothing, but I realized what you did. And for that, I'm grateful. That cross, God, that cross, it means so much. So wherever you find yourself, if you want to accept Christ in your life, just repeat after me. Say, dear Lord Jesus, I realize that I failed you. I realize that I've sinned. And I want to invite you into my life to save me. And just say, dear, say, dear God, come into my life and save me and give me a fresh start. And thank you, God, for saving me. In your name, amen. I'm going to say if you prayed that prayer, believe you me, God has entered your life. God has come into you, and he's, given, he's going to give you a fresh start. He's going to take your sins away, and you are on your way to heaven. That's good news. In the Old Testament, the lambs and the rams and the goats and the bulls, they could make you feel clean, but they couldn't take you to heaven. The cross and the Christ of the cross, he can do just that. He can get you there. He can do that there. So we thank you for the word this morning. We thank God for what you're doing. We thank you for who you are and what you've done. As the worship team just sings this song softly, then we're going to allow God to have his way. Then we're going to close our service out this morning. Bless your love.